So uh, our first uh, panelist today is um, on the panel of gender and form on stage and page is Farah Ali. She's an assistant professor from Lahore University of Management Sciences in Pakistan. And her research focuses on the works of Harold Pinter, especially identity politics and his work and gender issues. She is generally interested in post-war British theater and has published a book on the predicament of identity in the selected works of Harold Pinter. Thank you. Our second panelist is uh, Abhinav uh, Chatterjee, who is coming to us uh, from India. He uh, asked me to introduce him uh, as a research scholar pursuing his doctorate in absurd drama. Um, and finally, uh, David uh, Melville Wingrove uh, from the University of Edinburgh uh, teaches literature and film studies and uh, describes himself as a lecturer in Hollywood glamour and gothic excess. And I definitely need to upgrade my, my self-presentation after having read that. <laughs> so um, Far, do you want to uh, kick us off? Yeah, sure, definitely. Uh, I just uh, need to... Um, Share my presentation. Mm. Uh. 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 I'm looking for my um presentation here uh, <clears throat> um, sorry um, I don't know, I can't find <laughs> the presentation. I'm just gonna start reading the presentation and then, uh, well, today I'm uh, presenting on <clears throat> two plays. Uh, one of them is for Hal Pinter, A Kind of Alaska, uh, which was uh, staged in 1982. And the other one is for Brian Frail, which is called Molly Sweeney. And that was staged in 1994. Uh, this is a still a work in progress, uh, but, and I would really appreciate uh, your thoughts on, um, on the paper, uh, but I just thought of talking about the idea of disease and wellness in both uh, plays and how the uh, two female characters in the plays are being treated in terms of their doctor-patient relationship uh, in, in both plays, as we have two sick female characters uh, who are the major characters in, in both uh, plays. Uh, before starting uh, with a kind of Alaska, uh, I need to give a little bit of background of uh, Howell Pinter's experience or inspiration for this play. He came across the memoirs of the um, a neurologist called Oliver Sachs. And I think people who are interested in Howell Pinter must have come across this name who um, documented his experiences with uh, treating a disease that was at the time called uh, encephalitis lethargica or simply the sleeping sickness, which hit Europe uh, in the years of 1916 and 1917. Um, the sleeping sickness was unlike any other sickness at the time because of the varying symptoms that it gave to the people it, it hit and uh, not two people would, would share the same symptoms which confused the scientists at the time. Uh, the uh, title for my uh, paper actually comes from the uh, name that um, a psychiatrist and a neurologist at the time called Constantine uh, von Economo uh, uh, you know, uh, called it it's, uh, called the the, the sickness uh, uh, Hydra with thousand uh, heads, and that's why uh, I call the paper Hydra with thousand heads because of the um, multiple symptoms of the disease. Uh, you might wonder what are these uh, symptoms? Well, the symptoms 
uh, varied from uh, you know uh, Parkinson's uh, to uh, schizophrenia to uh, rabies. Uh, so all these uh, you know uh, symptoms that don't have anything. Uh, in common uh, were affecting uh, the patients. Um, the uh, drug for the disease at the time uh, was only uh, found in the 1960s. So you see the span of time between the disease and the drug that, that supposedly uh, cured it. Uh, but the drug, um, and this is something that I would like to emphasize here, did not actually heal the patient, it just cured the symptoms, but they really struggled after the, uh, you know, they were hit with the disease in the healing process because they didn't actually heal completely. There's something just like uh, what was recently experienced by people who were hit by COVID and then what we now know, uh, know as um, the long COVID uh, effect. One of the patients actually who was treated by uh, Dr. Sachs was referred to his memoir uh, as Ms. D. Uh, she said, uh, I actually would like to call um, the, the drug, which was at the time called Ildopa, as hell dopa because of the hell that it has given her, uh, you know, after receiving the treatment. So the major character in a kind of Alaska actually suffers supposedly from this sickness, which is the sleeping sickness. And she has been asleep she's called Deborah, and she has been asleep for 29 years. She was hit by the sleeping sickness when she was 16, and she uh, was asleep for 29 years. So she, when she woke up, she was a grown woman of 45 uh, years old. Uh, that is the first character. Uh, as in the second play, we have a completely different sickness, which is blindness. Uh, and uh, the same miraculous a uh, drug that has been used in order to cure this lady who was called Molly by her doctor who's called Dr. Rice. But the same uh, you know, fate is met uh, by Molly uh, with the tragic consequences after regaining her eyesight, her um, whole condition deteriorates and instead of enjoying a better, healthier life with her eyesight back, she actually uh, you know, just slips into a coma and then uh, it's not indicated uh, by the end of the play whether she dies or not, but all the, uh, you know, um, the conversation and the dialogue in the play um, indicates that she's not going to be a healthy uh, human being again the way she was in the past. So I'm comparing and contrasting those characters. Here I am using uh, the model that has been offered by uh, a sociologist called Talcott Parsons. Of course, I am just experimenting with theories. Uh, so this is just, uh, you know, uh, as I said, a work in progress, but he suggested a definition for the uh, sick role and what are the responsibilities and uh, the obligations of the person who gets sick. Because in this case, uh, we see that the characters have been treated in such a way as to uh, make us wonder, um, what are our obligations towards them? What do we want to interrogate in their situation? And what do we want to uh, you know, uh, know by reading those plays? And what was on the authors or the playwrights mind when they depicted those two situations um, uh, to the audience? So Talcott Parsons uh, said that uh, the, um, that uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the sick person, uh, or sickness actually indicates deviance uh, because the patient needs to be passive, uh, trusting, and willing to wait for medical treatment. Uh, deviance here is used in the sense uh, of withdrawal from work and passivity because you are not functioning as an, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a fully functional human being in society, and suppose that you are withdrawing from your normal uh, or daily life activities. Um, the doctor's obligation in this case is to direct the patient back to health and validate the patient's disease. Those around the patients have the obligation to suspend the patient's normal responsibilities of work and uh, family life. Uh, so there are certain uh, you know, uh, responsibilities and obligations that are divided uh, you know, between the doctor and the patient themselves.
Well, you might wonder for the rationale why I'm using Talcott Parsons theories, even though his uh, work, uh, The Social System, his book was published in 1951, uh, and it's been over 60 years uh, since the publication of that book. I believe that the authoritarian paternalistic view of the doctor-patient relationship, even though the approach to treating illness now is more person or patient-centered, rather than doctor centered, we still need to address the power and authority invested in the doctors. One of the critics echoes that by saying, every day we confront the drug of the past, old ideas about women's and men's roles and ways of behaving still flourish and get in the way. Moreover, considering that both main characters in the selected plays are women, it is even more important to focus on the patient's agency as women are still complaining of not being given enough information regarding their illness and their bodies. Although several aspects might have changed since then, it is deeply disheartening that the original aim of women's health movement are still being pursued. Recent consultation with women found that women needed information to make informed choices, but were not receiving it. Pinter's Deborah and Files Molly too, I believe, echo uh, these feelings shedding light on the unidentified and rarely discussed cases of those patients who whose mind and body don't obey the rules of this world and struggle to face the world as we know it uh, today uh, as i said i'm building my analysis uh, on talcott parsons uh, you know uh, theory uh, and uh, I would like to get into uh, some details uh, of the uh, of the plays. Uh, Deborah uh, wakes up as a woman of uh, 55, uh, 45 years old after being, uh, you know, uh, sleeping for uh, some time. Uh, her doctor is her brother-in-law and uh, also the one who is in charge of the family. So he has enjoyed this sort of power over the family for some time. And he expressed it in the dialogue by saying, uh, I have never let you go. Uh, the procedure of waking Deborah up is uh, by injecting her with uh, some fluid that's supposed to be representing the ill dopa drug that I have been uh, talking about. And uh, from there on, uh, Hornby feels that he is responsible for chartering uh, Deborah's itinerary. Um, although this suggests an authoritarian approach to the doctor-patient relationship, I think uh, Parsons' definition uh, puts things into more balanced perspective when uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, he believes that, you know, because some people will think that, it, no, no, the people are involved in the decision making when it comes to their sickness. He says, yes, that's true, uh, because lay people have a certain amount of knowledge and understanding in matters of health and illness, which somehow proves that it is not only doctors who have the real know-how now uh, to, when it comes to treating people, but Parson provides a significant reminder for us that lay judgments are notoriously fallible. Um, the doctor-patient relationship in Deborah's and Molly's case, uh, Molly's case is not that professional as described by Parsons. There are several reasons why I think the balance that he suggested at least in the relationship favors the doctor over the patient in both uh, plays. And there is another, uh, you know, concern, or I would say, uh, a layer to the uh, theory that I am uh, suggesting, is that well, this is the case with someone who is physically ill. But some critics uh, wondered, what if somebody is chronically ill, so their condition is not temporal, and uh, what if somebody is psychologically ill? How would we uh, be engaging with the psychologically ill patient? Because the psychologically ill patients are expected to show some kind of engagement with the doctor rather than being passive and willing to trust the doctor completely. Uh, so some of the implications of his theories will bring me more to the question that is linked to the two plays I'm discussing here. How should we see Deborah and Molly uh, as patients in this case? Is their illness purely somatic? Is it mental or is it both? And if it is both, did the doctors as depicted in those two plays do their job with professional neutrality to ensure 
and effective practice of scientific medicine. So those are some of the uh, you know, concerns and layers to the uh, theory. In the, in, in the case of Molly Sweeney, just to shed some light on, on her case, the same paternalistic you know, authoritarian relationship Myers have uh, you know her whole life and the uh, professional relationship that should have been flourished between her and her doctor, Mr. Rice. Molly has been blind since she was 10 months old. Now that she is 41, her husband of two years, Frank, who is known for embracing new projects until they fail, has suggested that she should go and see Mr. Rice, who is an ophthalmologist, to regain her eyesight. Molly did not like Mr. Rice when she first saw him but she got to like him later on. While Molly's attachment seemed to come naturally, Mr. Rice's motive don't. Just like Hornby, he has got other motives. As a deserted husband whose wife left him for his best friend, he suffered feelings of depression and exile for some time before, show, before Molly showed up on, on the scene uh, in his house. So if the operation on Molly proves successful, Mr. Rice thinks Molly could be the chance of the lifetime to pull himself together and prove his worth. With these thoughts on Mr. Weiss's mind, we think of Parsons' parameters of professional doctor-patient relationship, and in this case, they are a, a bit thrown into disarray. However, uh, I don't want us to think of Molly and Deborah as completely subservient, passive, all quiet women. They do, uh, you know, they don't play the sick role as uh, described in Parsons' definition mentioned earlier. When Deborah is told that she has been asleep for the last 29 years, she counters um, or, uh, you know, replies to uh, or, or challenges Hamby by saying, "Why should I not have been? Uh, why should? Why shouldn't I have a long sleep for a change? My body demands it. It's quite natural." And when her sister, who is also present in the scene, asks the doctor whether she should tell her uh, lies or truth, the doctor says, well, tell her both. Uh, so um, Deborah seems to be having an existential problem here. Therefore, I think uh, her problem is seen on three levels. First, she's being fed, uh, you know, um, uh, she's being fed uh, wrong, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, information. She can She's frozen in the body, uh, and she is, uh, you know, uh, she cannot really uh, verify her, uh, uh, her, her, uh, her problem, whether she has been really, uh, uh, you know, sleeping because her memory is is very is is, is uh, frag disfragmented. Um, so. Uh, I just want uh, now that you know uh, time is uh, you know is is, uh, is running out. I just wanted to um, uh, uh, highlight that uh, in Molly Sweeney, while the conversation in Hal Pinter's a kind of Alaska is happening, like people are interacting with each other, the conversation in Molly Sweeney is not. Each of the characters interact differently. And they uh, they have a, a monologue, uh, you know, uh, separately. So uh, while uh, Brian Fell uh, uh, focuses on hearing, on the sound, we see that Howard Pinter is focusing on the spectacle, on the watching. And this is something interesting uh, because it, it it marks how uh, both uh, playwrights are. Uh, focusing on the very thing that is, you know, it, it holding those characters back or like restricting those characters from fully uh, um, achieving the, the healing process that they are, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they were aiming uh, for. So while focusing on two different faculties to engage the audience with the place, both Pinter and Fryle succeeded in presenting scientifically evidenced cases of two different diseases with tragic consequences for the protagonist. Interestingly, in both plays, the medical element is essential, uh, as some of the critics discuss that it's always, however, it is always subservient to the human as the most supposedly knowledgeable characters who are the doctors uh, guide the patient, or support, who were supposed to guide the patient and protect them, employ the most damaging tools due to their short-sightedness, which cast a long shadow over the doctor-patient relationship that needs to be further addressed. I believe that Deborah and Molly's silence, because both of the characters eventually they keep silent, is quite telling, particularly in the current times 
while the world is struggling with unprecedented spread of virus and disease. Those who had to suffer and encounter death with that palliative care invite us all to consider a better approach to healthcare and the sick hall in the future. I hope I, uh, you know, I kept the time. Thank you. Thank you, Farah. And I will now turn things over to our second presenter, Avanov. Uh, I hope I am audible. Thank you, sir. But just Okay, so this is the title of my presentation, Revitalizing the Political Avant-Garde in the Absurd Plays of, uh, and I have selected these two plays, Ionesco's Rhinoceros and Pinter's The Room. <clears throat> now, Avant-Garde has become a ubiquitous label, eclectically applied to any type of art that is anti-traditional in form. At its simplest, the term is sometimes taken to describe what is new at any given time. The leading edge of artistic experiment, which is continually outdated by the next step forward. But avant-garde is by no means value neutral. Um, as such uh, usage implies. For Lara Cox, for example, I'm giving just the, uh, a few instances, term is synonymous with uh, the notion of pushing artistic boundaries, thereby creating new forms of art. Uh, for Marxist critics like George Lucas, it becomes synonymous with decadence, a cultural symptom of the malaise engendered by Bourgeois. Uh, for uh, Bourgeois society, while for apologists, it is a defining imperative in all art of our time. And the modern genius is essentially avant-gardistic. Envisioning a revolutionary future, it has been equally hostile to artistic uh, uh, tradition, sometimes including its immediate predecessors as to contemporary civilization. Indeed, on the surface, the avant-garde as a whole seems united primarily in terms of what they are against. <clears throat> the rejection of social institutions and established artistic conventions or antagonism towards the public as representative of the existing order. By contrast, any positive program tends to be claimed as exclusive property by isolated and even mutually antagonistic subgroups. So modern art appears fragmented and sectarian defined as much by manifestos as imaginative work and representing the amorphous complexity of post-industrial society in a multiplicity of dynamic, but unstable movements focused on philosophic abstractions. Hence, the use of isms to describe them, symbolism, futurism, expressionism, and all those. However, beneath, beneath this diversity, there is clearly identified a unity of purpose and interest, which has all the characteristics of co a coherent trend, since its principles can be shown to be shared quite independent of direct influence. Now, <clears throat> coming to the absurd, uh, the term absurd was linked to the theatrical practices of a heterogeneous groups of playwrights, uh, such as Ionesco, Beckett, and Pinter, that evolved in the post-World War II and which was characterized by its deviation from the natural and logical norms of language realistic character, situations, and all other theatrical conventions. In its endeavor towards depiction of the senselessness of life, these playwrights reduced plot and characters to a bare minimum, as a result of which the plays were categorized as avant-garde. However, like its many predecessors, the absurd had lost its relevance of the newness that dominates the definition of the avant-garde. According to Rola Barth, the theater of the absurd was a once destabilizing force on social class that had run out of subversive stream. 
Bart attributes this loss to the adaptation of the newness of the absurd by the theater goers, thereby making it marketable. Now, Martin Eslin, who coined the label of the absurd to these playwrights, related it to the pessimistic tone of existential philosophy. Influenced by the philosophy of existentialism as propounded by Camus in his The Myth of Sisyphus, plays of these playwrights were generally read as tracing the meaninglessness of life, of world. Eslin quotes Camus to support the pessimism inherent in the existing uh, existential philosophy. And uh, this is a uh, quote that I, I'm not going to read it out. However, the continued relevance of the element of avant-garde in the plays of the theater of the absurd lies in its adaptation to the contemporary circumstances. The plays under consideration, UNESCO's The Rhinoceros and Printer's The Room, testify to the continued relevance of absurdity in contemporary times. Camus has very rightly stated that <coughs> at any street corner, the feeling of absurdity can strike any man in the face as it is in its distressing nudity, in its light without effulgence, it is elusive. From here, I will go just to analyze two plays. First, Rhinoceros. Rhinoceros is UNESCO's artful blend of his anti-theater into a formalized at attack on logic. Clearly formed in the historical moment in which it is written, anti-logic presents itself in the metaphor of the rhinoceros which UNESCO uses to question the validity and significance of Western society and specifically society's blind acceptance of the ideology of Western logic. Rhinoceros dramatizes the plight of Beringer, an average citizen in a nameless French city who witnesses the staff in the government office where he works gradually turning into rhinoceros. The experience play presented in the play is surreal as interchangeable bodies are represented through the transformation of the characters into rhinoceroses. The spectator is shown a grotesque picture of their own world in an absurd manner with an emphasis on the solitude of man. The play can also be interpreted from a political and ideological perspective as it has a strong political and ideological association which can be revealed upon a close reading. In this respect, ideology plays a significant role in the play. Much criticism has been devoted to the study of the play in the context of other absurdist drama, yet critics have often overlooked the exigencies that account for its creation. Why would this Romanian-born playwright be led to a stage, a drama, about the terrible cowardice to which individuals submit in the face of political tyranny, or about the ease with which those individuals will betray their friends in order to conform to popular ideology? I would like to propose that in its final episode, where Berenger, the protagonist of the play, takes the oath of reviving the human race, Ionesco <clears throat> subscribes to Nietzsche's philosophy of overman. The play can be re read as a critique of conformism, with Berenger refused to, refusing to succumb to the populist notion. If transformation is transformation is taken to be of symbolic value. Rhinoceroses stand for the individuals who adhere to a certain ideology. These rhinoceroses symbolize, uh, I quote, a prior inner transformation of humans who believe that brute force can render them supermen and place them above the laws of nature when in fact the only power they have is their strength in numbers. These individuals lose their distinctive features and are molded in a one-sided way. Accordingly, Jean, one of the characters, says, moral standards, I am sick of moral standards. We need to go beyond moral standards. He is not content with his current situation and ultimately becomes one of the rhinoceroses. <clears throat> now, this is an important comment by Ionesco. He says, one of the great critics in New York complains that after destroying conformism, I put nothing else in its place, leaving him and the audience in a vacuum. Now that is exactly what I wanted to do. A free man should pull himself out of vacuity on his own, by his own efforts and not by the efforts of other people. In view of this comment by Ionesco, rhinoceritis, 
does not appear to be a disease due to which the apparent genetic mutation occurs. Rather, it is symbolic of what Nietzsche refers to as the herd mentality. That at the conclusion of the play, Beringer remains a, remains a soul human, hints very much to the character of Zarathustra, who proclaimed the need to be the overman. Ionesco's ultimate goal within Rhinoceros was not to shock people with theatrical stage effects and witty dialogue. That was merely the form. Rhinoceros is one of Ionesco's most effective anti-plays because of the skill with which he uses that framework. Ionesco's anti-logic is used not to express the banality of language and parlor room dialogue, but to deliver a full-on attack of collective ideologies. Unlike his other plays like The Bald Soprano and The Lesson, Rhinoceros goes further to employ the anti-play structure to discrete, uh, desegregate uh, modern logic. Though it seems at first that Ionesco's anti-play will not be as effective in the, play, in the way it was originally intended, Rhinoceros can be effective because the primary focus of the play is, a, is, is its theme. A theme that is timeless and can be appreciated in both its historical and current context. Rhinoceros is a warning sign of those who have succumbed to a collective ideology and it retains its strength because of the continuing epidemic of mass conformity. The plays of Harold Pinter, according to Varun Begley, collectively traverse the great divide between modernism and its historical others. Popular entertainment, politically committed art, technological mass culture. Pinter's plays were already uh, always already political. Their radical potential, however, appears in inverse ratio to their thematic explicitness. Despite their artistic authority and compelling concerns, the overtly political pieces only serve to confirm the status quo of ideological partition and social petrifaction. Conversely, the negative aesthetics of provocation, provisionality, and undecidability impart the establishment in all its varieties and contribute not only to include the unimagined in the process of democracy, but to contemplate and transform democratization per se. The room clearly inhabits a social reality of depravity and racism, as well as allegorical aspirations. And the racial killing demonstrates the results of inadequate integration as much as it aspires tentatively to any form of transcendence. Pinter's unconventional dramaturgy developed the tension of the play by keeping the audience at an equal level of ignorance as its chief character, Rose, a woman of about 60. As Henry Wolfe, the director of the first performance of the play in 1957, described how, confronted with the deliberately dislocated frame, and I quote, the audience woke up from its polite cultural stupor and burst into unexpected life, laughing, listening, taking part in the story unfolding on stage. It is out of this ambiguity that the absurd in the play arises. The ambiguity is primarily the output of the absence of information. Before Pinter, the audience shared crucial information that would lead to the dramatic tension in the play. However, Pinter, in following the uh, conventions of the absurd theater and the resulting avant-garde, refused to share the crucial information. Thus, structurally, his plays, like those of Ionesco's before him, lack a proper beginning and an end thereby leaving the plays open-ended. The room is full of such incomplete information. The audience is not aware at all whether uh, <coughs> Bert and Rose are couple, the identity of the Negro and his relationship with Rose, as also why Rose goes blind at the end. The stage directions do not mention the two as couple. Similarly, the relations between Rose and the Negro are left for the audience to interpret. As Mark Taylor Batty points it out, his given name, Riley, both supports and troubles his otherness, as the name is ethnically Irish on origin. In urging Rose to come back with him, 
Riley reminds her of a supposed existence and identity that she has been constant, uh, consistently denying. This can be related to Nietzsche's insistence on the Dionysian self that has been lost ever since the rise of the Apollonian self with the post-Socratic Greek culture. The championing of the Apollonian self can only be truly acclaimed when the opposition of the Dionysian self is appreciated. Thus, Riley's insistence to Rose to come with him and recognize her true or the Dionysian self can only lead to a complete appreciation of her own self. To conclude, the theater of the absurd was labeled thus by Martin Esslin due to its dramatization of nothingness and its minimalism, both of action, language, and plot. However, as Lara Cox points it out, this is not the end of the story. The politics of the avant-garde in these plays is revitalized with the recognition of multiple facets to which these plays can be subscribed to. Lara Cox in her study, uh, Afterlife of the Theatre of the Absurd, has subjected the plays to a reading that, I quote, envisage alternative realities cast free of gender, racial, and sexual in injustice, unquote. In so, in so doing, these plays repeatedly divest ideologies of their meanings, shattering the existing value systems and leading its audience to the realization of multiple modernities. The absurd theater is generally taking, uh, taken to stand in contrast against committed theater in being apolitical, thereby enabling a playwright to address either contemporary issues or universal ones. However, this contrast, uh, this contrast is deconstructed by the playwrights as they present their audience with their realization. And this is a quote, I will end with quote by quoting Pinter. A thing is not necessarily either true or false. It can be both true or false and false. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abhinav. And now turn things over to David. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to I'm just going to share my screen. We'll see we'll see how that works. Um, um, ah, here we are. Okay, good. Um, quick moment of panic. Um, can right? Can everybody can everybody see can everybody see the PowerPoint? I hope. Hello? Yes, I can sir. see it. You can, okay, <laughs> great, okay. Thank you, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And a big thanks to the Louisville Conference for the opportunity to present my paper online. It's great to be back in Louisville, even remotely. And I'm just very sorry I'm not able to be there in person. What I'd like to talk about today is a text that people are more likely to know from its filmed adaptation. The 1963 film, The Servant, directed by Joseph Losey and scripted by Harold Pinter and starring G Dirk Bogard, James Fox and Sarah Miles, is one of the key British films of the 60s and is hailed even today as a pioneering work of gay or queer cinema. For anybody who hasn't seen it, it's the story of a creepy and distinctly sinister manservant named Barrett, played by Dirk Bogard, who insinuates his way into the household of a young, handsome, and utterly feckless aristocratic bachelor named Tony, played by James Fox. Barrett gradually asserts control over the house and manipulates his young master into what may or may not, by the end, be a gay relationship. Although nothing is ever shown or stated overtly, we must remember male homosexual relations were illegal in the UK at that time and partially decriminalized only in 1967, the film remains a landmark in the depiction of homoeroticism and same-sex desire on screen. Or at least it looks that way until you read the original novella on which the film is based. Published in 1948, the Servant was the second novel by a young British writer named Robin Maugham, who also bore the hereditary title of Second Viscount Maugham of Hartfield. As his name suggests, he came from a prominent upper-class family, 
His father was the Lord Chancellor, and his uncle was none other than the world-famous best-selling novelist W. Somerset Maugham, known for his epic sagas like Of Human Bondage and The Razor's Edge. Like the young anti-hero of his novel The Servant, Robin Maugham trained originally as a barrister, but after his service in the North African desert during World War II, decided to concentrate on writing. The Servant, suitably enough, is the story of two young upper-class English war veterans. One of them is Tony, the young hero. The other is Tony's close friend and army buddy, Richard Merton, who narrates the story in the first person. It is through his eyes that we see the gradual destruction of Tony at the hands of Barrett, and also through his eyes that we feel his own awakening sense of his desire and love for Tony which culminates in the end of the novel as a more or less overt declaration of same-sex love. Now in the film, by eliminating Richard entirely as a character and focusing on the interplay between Tony and Barrett, Losey and Pinter actually de-gay the material considerably and place the emphasis on its voyeuristic and sensational aspects, not on the discreet but nonetheless positive assertion of gayness we get in the book. Now, this positive assertion of gayness was enough to get the young author into serious hot water with his uncle, the eminent, gay, but profoundly closeted novelist, W. Somerset Maugham. The elder Maugham's fiction tends to deal with gayness in one of two ways, both of which are illustrated in his 1944 magnum opus, The Razor's Edge. In that book, we have one covertly gay character in the camp social climber, Elliot Templeton a man who is waspish, effete, snobbish, and more or less entirely asexual. We have another covertly gay character in the form of Sophie MacDonald, a young society girl who drops out of respectable circles, becomes an alcoholic, goes to sleep with sailors in the port of Marseille, and winds up getting her throat cut. A pattern of behavior that was fairly unheard of for a woman in those days, but one that was quite widely associated with gay men. Faced with the more overt depiction of homosexuality in his nephew's novel, the older mom was horrified. He felt his nephew was caught courting disaster and relations between them cooled considerably for quite some time. Indeed, the focus from the very first pages of the survey is on Richard's unexpressed but all pervasive love and desire for Tony. This is a mixture of schoolboy crush, army comradeship, and powerful but inarticulate gay desire. This comes through most powerfully early on in the book when Richard is assailed by memories at a regimental dinner. And in all, all those memories, it was Tony who was by my side. He strode along the road in the pale sunshine. He watched the moon glittering in the water. He crawled under the tarpaulin into the smoky bivouac. He danced ludicrously in Alexandria. My eyes filled with tipsy tears. I looked round the hall for him. I found him standing by himself, pretending to examine a picture. It is Richard who helps Tony to settle into post-war London after his service in the army, who helps him find a small house to rent in Chelsea while he is studying for the bar, and who recommends, fatally as it turns out, that he take on a manservant to run the house for him. Richard reacts with distaste to the man that Tony winds up taking on, perhaps, although of course he never says so, because the more or less overt queerness of Hugo Barrett stirs up an awareness of his own long suppressed queer nature. Tony describes Barrett in the sort of terminology that was commonly used in 19th and early 20th century writing to denote sexually suspect characters. He was over six foot, and I was surprised a tall man could move so delicately. His shoulders were narrow, and his hands were long and bony. One expected his mouth to match his features, but in the middle of his sallow face were stuck a pair of rosebud lips, which gave him the look of a dissolute cherub. His lids were heavy and looked oily. The contrast between his head and his body was disconcerting, as if a baroque angel was stuck on a gothic spire. The tone here is none too subtly homophobic, and also, as some critics have pointed out, covertly anti-Semitic. 
there is at least a possibility that Barrett may be Jewish as well as gay, and that seems to add fuel to Richard's dislike and jealousy of him. The turning point in the story comes when Barrett introduces a young girl named Vera into the house, saying she is his 16-year-old niece and procuring her a job as a maidservant. Vera, who is played in the film by Sarah Miles, seduces Tony with the collusion of Barrett as a ploy to get the young master more securely under the servant's thumb. It is easy to read this seduction as a proxy for one man's seduction of another, and this was a device that was quite commonly used in homoerotic fiction of the 19th and 20th centuries, most notably in Wilkie Collins' 1866 novel Armadale, where two men who seem powerfully attracted to one another are both seduced by the flame-haired femme fatale Lydia Gwilt. But the actual genesis of the character of Vera is a bit more complicated than that, and has powerful autobiogra autobiographical echoes for Robin Maugham's own life. In his 1973 autobiography, Escape from the Shadows, Robin Maugham relates an incident that took place when he himself was a young man, living in a rented house in Chelsea and being looked after by a manservant he refers to as Barrett. It happened when he was entertaining Mary Churchill, the author and daughter of the Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill, and goes down to the kitchen to look for beer. There was no one in the kitchen, but the door to the servant's room, which led off the kitchen, was open and the lights were on. Lying naked and spread eagled on the bed was a boy of about 14. While I stared at this vision in astonishment, a soft voice spoke behind me. I can see you were admiring my young nephew, sir, Barrett said. Would you like me to send him up to say good night, sir? At that moment, I could see myself caught up in the mesh of a smooth voiced blackmailer. I pretended I'd not heard a word he had said. Good night, Barrett, I said crisply and walked up the stairs. What we see here is a Machiavellian sexual operator pimping not his niece, but his underage nephew as a honey trap to blackmail a member of the upper classes. The character of Vera is at least partially a boy in disguise and the servant in some ways is a fantasy of what Robin Maugham's own life as a gay man might have been if he had not known well enough to say no. In the novel, Tony gives in to the seduction of Vera, and this triggers in him an obsessive and self-destructive passion that destroys him not only morally, but physically. It is hard to read Richard's descriptions of Tony's gradual physical decay and not be reminded of what is perhaps the urtext of 20th century homoerotic writing in English, Oscar Wilde's 1891 novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray particularly those passages where Dorian observes the decay of his portrait as his own forbidden sexuality eats him away and destroys him from within. At various points in the novel, Richard observes, against the black of his dinner jacket, his face looked white and bloating. The curly fair hair which tumbled about his head seemed to have no connection with the mask it encircled so that it looked like a gold wig stuck on the plate of an old, the pate, sorry, of an old actor. Later on, one evening he came back from Lincoln's Inn looking exhausted. The crisp golden hair fell about the face of a corpse. And towards the end of the book, he had grown fat, almost gross. There were puffy bags of flesh under his eyes and his skin was rough and mottled. Written half a century after the picture of Dorian Gray, The Servant is similarly a parable about the potentially destructive power of queer sexual desire, with Tony in the role of Dorian, Richard as the horrified onlooker Basil Hallward, and Barrett as the epicene corrupter Lord Henry Wootton. In eliminating the character of Richard entirely from the film version, the director Joseph Losey and his screenwriter Harold Pinter remove the most powerful and positive gay dimension from the story and make it less a film about sex than one about power. As Colin Gardner so rightly points out, as in most of his novels, Maugham stresses this homosexual undercurrent as a key leveler between the different social classes. 
Losey and Pinter downplay this relationship, showing Barrett as less interested in sex per se than the latent power it allows him to wield over his charges, whether male or female. This places the servant in line with other Losey films like Ava, Accident, and The Go-Between, the latter two also scripted by Pinter, where sex most definitely occurs, but only as a vehicle for the constant shifting of class and power relations, and not for the revelation of any one character's sexual identity. Nevertheless, dissenting voices have always viewed The Servant as a gay film. The critic, Stephen Bourne, insists that we are quite plainly meant to view Barrett as predominantly queer. His prissy walk and accent, his talent for cooking, interior decorating, and flower arranging all suggest this. He has also pinned a collection of hunky and homoerotic bodybuilder pinups on his bedroom wall. But my favorite reading of the film comes from the Franco-Argentine critic and film director, Edgardo Kozarinsky, who suggests that the ambiguity so central to the film of the servant is actually what the film is primarily about. The overwrought decoration, the emotional outbursts, the heightened effects of mise-en-scene, from actors' gestures to camera movements, are all there as if between quotation marks. They illustrate something else, just as Brecht asked of actors that they should not seem to feel, but to quote. In other words, we are meant to feel the servant is actually about something else than it appears to be, and we are meant equally not to be sure what that something else is. The next twist in the story occurs when, when we find out that the girl, or boy, named Vera, is the lover not only of Tony, but of Barrett. She is not his niece or nephew at all, but his underage mistress or boy toy, whom he has brought to the house, at least in part, for his own sexual diversion. In the book, this discovery is made by Richard. In the film, it falls to Tony himself and his rather frigid on and off fiance played by Wendy Cray. The discovery is staged as perhaps the most covertly homoerotic moment in the film. A door opens at the top of the stairs, and we see a silhouette of Barrett standing there, presumably naked, and positioned so that Tony can see his body while we see only his shadow. Overlying this image on the soundtrack, we can hear the voice of Vera saying lines like, come to bed, don't you want me, and I'm waiting. Her role as an intermediary for one man's seduction by another moves here from the symbolic to the almost literal. This incident leads predictably to a big bust up. Barrett and Vera move out of the house, but Tony finds he's unable to cope without Barrett and invites him back to, to move in, this time on his own. In the film, the tone of their relationship shifts and they start to behave for the first time as a stereotypical bickering gay couple. Nothing, of course, is ever made explicit, but a scene where the two men play ball on a winding staircase and Barrett complains about playing from an inferior position can be read symbolically as a gay debate over who is on the bottom and who is on the top. The book, in contrast, con um, contains an oblique but explicit avowal that the relationship has by this time become sexual. It is an avowal that Tony makes to Richard in this tense, almost Pinteresque exchange of dialogue. Richard says, I don't think it's much more than that even now. Is it Tony? His eyes were haggard as he stared at me. It's more than that now, he said. You know it is. The film ends, as the book does, with the prelude to an orgy, where the domineering Barrett tries to keep Tony under his thumb by supplying him with new sexual playmates. The film goes further in this regard than the book does, although Sarah Miles recalled years later that poor Joe hadn't the faintest clue what anyone actually did at an orgy. The horrified witness to the orgy in the film is Wendy Craig as the fiancé Susan. In the novel, this role belongs to Richard, who confronts Tony and makes a shocking, if unprecedented, avowal. Suddenly, I felt his arm round my shoulder. Then he withdrew it again, as if he'd done something wrong. Oh, Richard, he said brokenly. Oh, my dear Richard, don't leave me. I'm unclean. I know I am. 
but don't leave me. Come with me then. He was silent. There was no sound from the kitchen. They were obviously listening. I'll do all I can to make you happy, I said softly. His bloodshot eyes were full of tears. Come with me. He stood swaying on his feet, staring at me. This discreet but unambiguous declaration of one man's love for another is of a nature that could not possibly have been uttered on screen in 1963, however much suggestive and photogenic decadence Pinter and Losey managed to pile on. It is here we realize, if we haven't already, that Robin Mon's novella is a landmark in 20th century gay writing. We may regret as readers that Tony refuses Richard and goes back to Barrett and the orgy. Predictably, Robin Mom hated the film of The Servant, which he saw as a complete betrayal of his book and the reasons he had chosen to write it. Having previously adapted it for the stage in 1958, he dramatized it all over again in 1966, and this second version is still occasionally performed today, most recently at a production at the, at the Théâtre Poche Montparnasse in Paris, where, ironically enough, Joseph Losey and his films are revered as they never have been in the English-speaking world. The story has also become a highly successful piece of dance theater, Play Without Words, adapted by the choreographer Matthew Bourne in a production that debuted in London in 2002. It has even become an opera by the contemporary Italian composer Marco Lutino, which premiered in 2008 at the Opera Festival in Macerata. If I choose to end on this image, that is because Robin Mom, in writing The Servant, was reaching to the sky for something nobody in the mainstream of English writing had ever quite achieved before, an explicit and unambiguous declaration of male-to-male -male love. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Those were three terrific papers from which I learned quite a bit. So <clears throat> I have a question that I thought I would uh, ask uh, to uh, kick us off. But um, if you uh, would like to ask a question, you can uh, raise your hand uh, in the uh, Zoom, or you can drop your um, question in the chat and I can uh, read it out if that's um, your preference. So my question is about Pinter who is the common thread through all of these um, papers. And it's a question about uh, politics because it seems to be the case that um, each paper has a different sense of the political valence of Pinter's work, um, a, a kind of uh, quasi-feminist anti-authoritarianism, um, uh, in 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 Farah's paper, uh, a kind of uh, utop utopian negative uh, vanguardism uh, in Abhinav's paper, and then um, maybe in in David's paper, um, something like uh, a kind of repressive uh, uh, or um, quasi Foucauldian uh, attempts to sort of redirect. Uh, desire into discourse in some way. So I'm just wondering if you could talk in direct terms about what you see the political content of Pinter's contribution being vis-a-vis uh, -vis your own archives. I'll, I'll be happy to answer that first if nobody else wants to. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I can't see the button to raise my hand. Um, the fascinating thing with Pinter, I mean, obviously he was, he was a life, you know, he saw himself very much as a lifelong anti-establishment figure, as a man of the left. Um, the thing that, fasc you know, that, that fascinates me as somebody who teaches and, uh, and researches on a lot of you know, gay and homoerotic writing is that even though Pinter, as far as we know, was 
entirely heterosexual. You know, there's, there's no indication that he was anything else. So much of his writing has a huge homoerotic charge to it. I think we can see that in some of the plays, certainly a play um, like Betrayal, where we have an affair between um, a man and his best friend's wife. And the real betrayal seems to be not by the wife, but of one man by the other. And that's what really seems to hurt the man who's been betrayed rather than anything his wife has done. Um, we can see similar homoerotic undercurrents in the films he wrote for Joseph Losey, um, The Servant, Accident, and even in a much later film, if anybody's seen Paul Schrader's The Comfort of Strangers. Again, it takes place in a decaying Venetian palazzo, and there's this sweaty homoerotic ambiance between Christopher Walken and the young and very beautiful Rupert Everett. So this is something that keeps coming up in Pinter's plays. And, and Pinter's screenplays, even though as far as anybody knows, there's, you know, there's no bio autobiographical alibi for that. That's really, you know, really all I have to contribute there. Uh, yeah, may I add something? Um, in case, uh, in, in, in light of the, you know, the focus of my paper, also Pinter, if I may add to David's uh, portrayal of Pinter, that Pinter, has been seen as a misogynist in most of mm. his plays, yet there is a heavy emphasis on the representation of gender. He ha the way he um, portrays women in his plays is not um, the typical portrayal of a subdued, subservient woman, but uh, it's like they're halfway through, but they're not completely there. And uh, uh, if I may uh, uh, build up on David's point of betrayal, we uh, see Emma, who's quite a strong uh, woman, independent, uh, who seems to be manipulating two men at the same time, and she keeps her affair with, uh, uh, with, with her husband's best friend for almost five years. Uh, yet she seems to be in the end uh, with a bitter sense of loss. Uh, yes, she moves on with her life, but she seems to be the loser in, in the three of them. They can pick up from where they left off as best friends. Uh, at least that's the impression that Winter gives us in the play. But um, yeah, Emma doesn't seem to be um, really uh, someone who can continue the same life mm -hmm. that she used to have when she was having this relationship with her husband and, uh, in, and you know, during the affair. Many other women, like uh, uh, if I may remember in, um, uh, party time, uh, there is also a group of women who are seen as independent, uh, who are enjoying this interaction with, with many men in their life, but uh, many of them are either failures in their marriages or they're looking for men. Uh, so they, are seem, they seem to be um, preoccupied with um, um, trivial matters that, that that are uh, sort of unbefitting of the position that they are enjoying. So there is this emphasis on the gender also in his plays uh, that uh, seems to be countering the, the, the image that, that he, uh, you know, uh, he has been seen with or like he has been thought of as, as a misogynist. I don't see him as such. Mm -hmm. So that is also another layer to his uh, politics if I, you know, uh, just to build up on David's, uh, of course, brilliant presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I, I agree totally what you say about betrayal. Absolutely. I was just wondering what uh, you could say about uh, the character of Ruth and the homecoming. Yeah, Is... yeah maybe uh, David. Uh... No, no, no. I, I, it's, it, it's not a play. I know you go ahead. Um, well, uh, Ruth seems to be, uh, yeah, someone who is uh, really, uh, it's, it's a bit odd, her situation, you know, she comes back with her husband who has been uh, in the United States, and then uh, she starts, uh, you know, bonding with the males, uh, and of course there is this, uh, you know, the, 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 the indication that there is uh, homosexual relationships in, that are happening in that uh, context, and uh, uh, yeah, and then she becomes a prostitute in the end, or, you know, there is indication that that is what, what uh, she ends up doing in the play. 
uh, and she seems to be manipulating all uh, you know men in the play but i i really uh, i have an ambivalent feeling about whether we could, how could we portray her? And I think many critics uh, share this feeling. So I really can't have like a firm uh, final uh, portrayal of how should we uh, see Ruth? Uh, is she someone who seems to be uh, in the end taming the whole uh, family or uh, the family in the end were able to uh, draw her to, to, to their world? It could be seen both ways. So. It is very, uh, you know, the balance there is, is very delicate. So I really, I don't have an opinion. Maybe uh, David would like to furnish us with a better opinion on that, or maybe you want. Um, again, I just don't know the play of the homecoming well enough. It's mm -hmm. it, it's one that I still need to explore. Um, but you know, the the, um, you know, the the question that Farah raised about uh, you know, is Emma you know, is Emma seen as the manipulator in the play? Um, one of the other differences you know, between Robin Maugham's novella of The Servant and Pinter's screenplay is that the Sarah Miles character, Vera, is made far more of a conscious manipulator by Pinter than she ever is in Maugham's novel. Um, mm. At the end of Maugham's novel, um, she's on the streets, she's a teenage prostitute, she's physically ill. You know, we, we, we actually feel great empathy and sympathy for her in the way we never do for Sarah Miles as, as Vera, as she's been adapted by Pinter and, Lo and Losey. I mean, I'd say it's going too far to portray Pinter as a misogynist, but I'd say he, often in his writing, he doesn't show great empathy or understanding for women. And I think that's certainly shown in, you know, in the way Vera's character is shifted from the novella to the film. That's an interesting point. Um, I had a question for uh, uh, Chatterjee, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. I don't know, maybe you could share more thoughts of um, the portrayal of Rose. You said uh, there is racism because there is a black man who claims or who asks Rose to you know, come back home we don't know whether he's her, her father or, you know, um, there was uh, this, um, the, the critics were divided as to whether to consider this as a, a um, direct racism in the play or what is exactly the, uh, the aim of portraying a black man at the end of the play. Uh, I was just interested to hear your thoughts about it because uh, you just mentioned it swiftly and uh, if you may elaborate on that a little bit. Well, uh, the reason why I mentioned uh, this character is, as I have said, that his name has a mixed blend of Irish and he is portrayed as Black. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's one of the things that is, uh, you know, uh, a physical stature will definitely go for a portrayal of racism and uh, but what I was more interested in is, uh, I, I have been uh, uh, quoting in a, a few instances from Nietzsche, and I was uh, taking the, uh, this uh, portrayal of this dark man, as I have mentioned, as a revelation of the dark self something that has been oppressed in that sense it can be at a, a physical manifestation of the racism oppression of the dark and the dark man going back and reclaiming the self the, there has been a lot of examples from other uh, uh, other parts of the world as well uh, we can talk about the Maori literature, we can talk about the Australian Aboriginal literatures and all the, those things. African literature has been there in the host. So we can say something similar to that. And yeah. of course, the Jewish background of uh, Pinter, uh, you know, forms an important part of uh, as anything that has been uh, that has been studied about him. So uh, going by that, those in going in those lines also, we can relate somewhere to the oppression and one part of uh, being black. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, may I ask another question? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was very much interested in David's uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, I have uh, come across uh, many of Pinter's films in which there is always this interaction, close interaction between uh, two male characters, uh, like the sleuth, um, uh, like, as you mentioned, the comfort mm. of the strangers. And I think uh, also the caretaker, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, betrayal. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure about the, the, the pumpkin eater, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, my question is, uh, do you think there is like, a, this warning theme of would we dare to say that this warning theme of uh, subtext of homosexuality in his play mm -hmm. in his films could we claim something like that or oh, that would be like too, too uh, simplistic uh, and uh, unfair a little bit to the complicated characterization of, of those characters i wonder what I, I, I don't think it's simplistic at all. Um, I think, um, I, I, but I do think we need to go a bit broader than that. I would say you, if, if you had to boil down into one sentence for me, what Pinterest plays are about, it's everything that is traditionally not acknowledged by British society. You know, that may be sexual feelings by one man for another, which was strictly taboo up, in, you know, up, up until 1967, and even then were problematic for many decades. But it also includes the racism and anti-Semitism that um, Ab Abinav, I, I, I hope I pronounced that properly, apologies if I didn't. It, also includes the racism and anti-Semitism that you were mentioning in your paper. I mean, as a Canadian who's lived most of his adult life in the UK, if you were to ask most British people, oh, do you think there's racism or, or, or xenophobia or anti-Semitism in our society? They'd say, oh no, of course not. And then of course, um, you know, five, six years ago, you had Brexit, which was based entirely on this massive popular feeling, oh, we don't want these foreigners coming to our country. Well, I'm sorry, which is it? So what Pinter is doing for me is he's picking up everything that traditional polite British discourse simply would not acknowledge, which is a lot. That may be sexual, that may be racial, that may be ethnic, but, but, but Pinter throughout his writing career seemed to have his antenna out for everything that British people were not saying. And I have to say, again, having lived in this country for decades, what British people don't say is a hell of a lot more than what many people in many other countries think but don't say. So you know, that's really, really the, the most I can answer that. Um, I, I have a question for Abhinav, if, if it's okay. Um, you know, I, I was fascinated by the way that you contrasted Pinter with um, Eugene Ionesco. Again, two examples of what could broadly be called theater of the absurd. But um, could you say a little bit about the way the very different cultures they come from have shaped their approach to the theater of the absurd? Again, um, British culture, which keeps so much repressed and so much unexpressed, and Romanian culture, and I've lived in Romania for three, four years, you know, which is one of the great cultures of let it all out now. You know, would, you, would you like to say a bit about that? Uh, well, <coughs> what connects your UNESCO, I'm not quite sure about uh, his uh, the influence of the Romanian culture to mm -hmm. his uh, in his plays, uh, mm -hmm. although there are slight elements, but I, I think it's the uh, immediate background of the 1940s and the 1950s that, mm -hmm. you know, that... Uh, uh, that shook the conventional beliefs 
the value mm-hmm. systems. Mm-hmm. The, that is the essence that has been there um, in the absurd theater. Mm-hmm. Basically, I, I understand absurd as a, you know, as a kind of effect that you know mm-hmm. disrupt dis- disturbs you. Mm-hmm. You uh, mm-hmm. it it seeks to bring you out of your uh, mm-hmm. bonded value systems, mm-hmm. uh, and in that way, both Pinter and Ionesco, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, s- subscribes to this absurd. Although it's mm-hmm. uh, it has become a uh, challenge term these days, but mm-hmm. that is how the uh, these two playwrights although belonging to different cultures as you rightly pointed it out uh, they they subscribe to this mm-hmm. kind of, uh, mm-hmm. this very broad notion of the absurd mm-hmm. yeah but, but at the same time yeah, i w- i would say unesco's approach to the absurd is deeply deeply romanian i mean uh, again having lived in romania worked in romanian organizations the first thing anybody in an organization will tell you is oh this is absurd and it doesn't work properly but we've all got to sort of go along with it anyway and just hope we can do something at the end of it and that's the way so much of life in romania tends to work um you know, in a positive way and a less positive way so you know, i I, and, and again, part, perhaps it's just my own life experience. I see UNESCO not just as an absurd author, but very much a Romanian author. I don't, you, I find it hard to imagine that anybody from any other culture or any other country could have written the plays that UNESCO did. You know, I read one now and I think, oh my God, this is like, you know, this is like being back in the office in Romania. And that's one of the things I love about it. Sure. Yeah. Plays of uh, UNESCO are unique in their own way. Mm, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, so the, the point is, I never think that absurd, uh, that, has, uh, that is uh, an argument that I've, I am uh, trying to put forward uh, with, you know, that those doctoral things. Uh, mm. uh, that absurd is never a negative term. Mm, absolutely. Absurd is never a negative term, and mm-hmm. the plays of Ionesco are perhaps the best examples. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I totally agree with you on that. Great. Um, and uh, as your paper and Dr. Farah's paper has already demonstrated, that the plays of Pinter can also be taken and as a very positive step. Mm-hmm. Towards towards liberating people out of the bonds that mm-hmm. the existing value systems put on you. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. I define absurd in that sense. Great. Um, could I, could I ask a question to to, to Farah? Um, I. I was fascinated the, 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 the way you talked about a kind of Alaska, which again, is not a Pinter play I know well. And I don't think it's one of the better known or more performed Pinter plays. Do you feel that this play with its themes of you know, illness and illness is a metaphor for so much else. Do you feel that this play will come into its own in terms of performance, in terms of public um, in public reception in a way it hasn't before, because we live against this background of COVID, lockdowns, pandemics. Do you feel this is a play whose time has come? Yes, yes, I totally agree. I think uh, a kind of Alaska has uh, sort of gained a, a new life, uh, coincidentally, uh, or, or maybe not, uh, because, particularly because over the COVID time, I think it, it, it was, it resonated very much with what we went through during the mm-hmm. COVID uh, on many uh, levels. Uh, first of all, uh, on a literal level that we were uh, immobile, so not necessarily immobile, like literally, but we were like restricted in terms of our mm-hmm. movement. And frozen in time, we didn't know whether we are going to be 
we're mm-hmm. moving forward or we're mm-hmm. going to be stuck in this moment forever. I mean, mm-hmm. that was times of uncertainty. And that is, I think, um, uh, something that Pinta really uh, portrays, not very in a very tangible way, but in a sort of like, it haunts his place that the feeling mm-hmm. of uncertainty, whether in a positive or a negative way, it depends, of course, on the context. But the uncertainty in, 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 in a kind of Alaska was a bit of, is a bit unsettling. Um, in terms of uh, how do we deal with, and, and that is, uh, I think it was implied in your comment, uh, that uh, uh, sickness implies many mm. other things. The way we deal with the, you know, w- when people are in a, in a vulnerable position, be it sickness, mm. be it something else like starvation or war, like now, you know, times were like, we never imagined that there's going to be another war, but here we are dealing with the Ukrainian-Russian war. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, how do we, and, and the earthquake, um, the unfortunate earthquake that recently hit areas of uh, Turkey and Syria. Uh, so uh, how do we deal with those catastrophes? How, because I think Pintel has invested more in the character of Deborah, the, the female character mm-hmm. who was uh, suffering from the sleeping sickness, in the sense that she was the conscious of the world, the, you know, mm-hmm. she was interrogating humanity's silence or mutism in that sense about such catastrophes, about mm. the, the amnesia, you know, the, um, um, the memory, the wrong memory or the um, misinformation in, the, mm. in light of the fake news, you know, the, that we are also, uh, you know, being affected by since 2016 and until, until today. So uh, I think the, uh, the play could be interpreted on so many levels that eventually connect to this sickness. So really, uh, I think you have you have summed it up by saying sickness here is not only sickness per se, mm. but uh, it indicates um, a, a, a disease in, in every aspect of life, especially in a political way. So definitely, mm. yes, I think it is very relevant now. And I think it should be uh, explored in light of these changes that, that, mm. that are, uh, you know, we are living through. And I think, mm. uh, it, it, it should be uh, the, the best way to do that, I think, to stage it in, or adapt it in such a way as to maybe answer some of the queries that we could not find answers to at that time. So I think in that sense, it is maybe a little bit ahead of its time. Maybe it mm-hmm. should have been staged later than 1982. Uh, mm-hmm. so, so, so yeah, maybe that, that answers uh, some of your questions. But yeah, it those does. are my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Maybe maybe most great plays are ahead of their time. Maybe that's what makes them great. I don't know. Yeah, right. I agree. I believe so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> we have a couple minutes left, and I wanted to ask uh, David uh, something about uh, adaptation uh, of mm-hmm. novels to film. And <clears throat> one of the things that uh, Benjamin underscores in his essay is the degree to which in the transition from uh, print to cinema, mm-hmm. uh, we we engage a mass audience in a way that we never mm-hmm. have, uh, at least recently, right? Um, uh, because anyone can see a film and not everyone knows how to read. For it. Mm-hmm. And uh, the politics of film are therefore necessarily mass politics. Mm-hmm. And what I'm wondering is, are the transformations that uh, happen to the servant legible in terms of the generic transformation from novel to film? Mm-hmm. Or are there other, are there counterexamples where the transition from novel to film has has sort of run the other way. That is to say, there's something about the heteronormativizing Mm -hmm. of the film that seems consistent with the transition to a mass politics, at least at the time. But like maybe there's a counterexample to that, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah, uh, I mean, you, for for me, the main um, you, the, 
the main transformation in the film of the servant, it's not just the um, you know, the heteronormativization, degaying, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's also you know, the the novel sexuality is is conveyed mainly through the first person narrator okay. Richard who's eliminated as a character in the yeah. film. And a first person narrative is very, very difficult to reproduce on film for obvious reasons. And even for, you know, even for purely technical reasons, beyond politics, beyond sexuality, you can see why they would have chosen to leave Richard out. Yeah. The fascinating thing is that if you look at the third of the Pinter Losey films, if anybody's seen The Go-Between, that's a first person narration as well by a little boy called Leo. And the film, again, directed by Pinter, um, is sorry, written by Pinter, directed by Joseph Losey, it actually reproduces that sense of first person narration very, very successfully in a way that films are not normally expected to do. And that's one of the fascinating things. You almost get the sense that in a decade of working together, Pinter and Losey started off oh, you know, not knowing how to reproduce first person narration. Mm -hmm. So let's just junk it. Okay. Um, eight, nine, 10 years later, oh, maybe we can do that after all. That's and that's an interesting thing to see. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Well, I think we may have reached the end of our um, very informative discussion. I, I thank all of our panelists, and mm -hmm. uh, I also thank the technology gods for making this <laughs> possible and relatively seamless. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I hope I'll see all of you here in person in Louisville uh, sometime in the future. I hope so. And, uh, I really want to come this year. I just couldn't. Yeah. Thanks to you all. And uh, I thank you. Thanks, thanks to us. Thanks to everybody. That was fascinating. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Enjoy Thank the you. Rest of your day. bye, -bye. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye.